Francis Bacon is generally accepted as one of the half dozen best painters in the world. No other British painter of this century has been held in anything like such high esteem. He can't produce enough work to keep up with the demand for it from museums and private collectors. Fame has made no difference to his way of life. His refused honors, he's uninterested in position and possessions. We all know that the, the most dangerous person we can meet is some kind of comrade, some kind of man on the other side of the law, somebody who doesn't conform to normal morality, but also somebody who feels a powerful urge to seduce. Bacon's myth took powerful root and was, I think, aided by the fact that he was seductive um, in the way that, dare one say it, some criminals are also seductive. Painting has now become, or all art has now become, completely a game by which man distracts himself. What is fascinating actually is that it's going to become much more difficult for the artist because he must really deepen the game to be any good at all and return the onlooker to life more violently. It is six years since the painter Francis Bacon died. Clues are now emerging which reveal that Bacon may have been at work on more secret and puzzling images than anyone had realized. Francis Bacon was a man of extreme contradictions. The Bacon who wandered through Soho, talking freely to everybody he met, seemed to bear no relation to the painter who worked alone in his studio in the early hours of the morning. There were often two very, very distinct sides to Bacon, and that was some part of his fascination, that he seemed split and you wondered um, how he managed to keep these things in balance. I mean, on the one hand, you could say he dissembled quite a lot, but on the other, he was extremely candid. <laughs> and he was enormously sort of um, vivacious and gregarious and uh, exuberant and sarcastic uh, and fun to be with. And I was immediately seduced. I think he seduced everybody. He said he used to come up with this phrase from time to time, séduire c'est tout, to seduce is everything. I think it's true to say that Bacon was an adept manipulator. Um, he knew exactly what he was doing when he was talking about his work. I'm not for a moment saying that he was deliberately lying, but what I am saying is that I think he edited himself very effectively. He was a marvellous conversationalist. Words came easy to him, perhaps easier, in fact, than, than painting in a strange way. And it's easy, I think, to take Bacon at face value and to think that what he says actually is the truth. Do you do drawings beforehand? No. You go straight onto the canvas? Yes. With the paint? Yes. I think Bacon was a con man in a rather special sense. One of the points of emphasis is that Bacon never drew. He is extremely categorical on the subject. It's not that he fudges uh, the point in any way. He never drew, he never sketched. He absolutely denied that he does any such thing. Bacon's own words on this subject are so extremely uh, uh, unmistakable, so direct, uh, that one must assume 
that he was to some extent a fantasist, that he didn't tell the truth about his own working procedures. Images are now coming out, fascinating images, which do tell us, I think, a great deal more about his working method and give the lie to the idea that this was a man who managed to paint, as it were, fully formed images straight onto the canvas. If you explode such an important part of the established myth, then you've got to reconsider the whole personality. Um, and that's a major demolition and reconstruction job. Barry Jewell first met his famous neighbor, Francis Bacon, in 1978, when he fixed his television aerial. He went on to become the artist's handyman, and he says, his friend for the last 14 years of his life. One of the duties Barry Jewell was asked to perform was the slashing of canvases, which failed to meet Bacon's exacting standards, an act which would prevent such work from ever being seen or sold. Yet Barry Jewell has in his possession several oil sketches and some 500 works on paper, which he claims Francis Bacon gave him a few months before he died. He phoned me up one morning and it sounded on the phone like he was gasping for life, like he was, he was dying. So I rushed over, I had a key, I went upstairs, and he was collapsed on his kitchen floor. The next morning I had a note shoved through my door, which I still have actually, to go and see Francis in the Cromwell. He'd, he'd, he'd recovered. He asked me to go back to the studio and remove certain things to take them into my flat. And he told me exactly where to go and what to take. And of course I was curious as to what he'd asked me to take. And I looked at them and they were these worked over, painted over, scratched, bent, twisted photographs. Finally, in April, so this would be three months after this event, he decided that he would go to Madrid. He wanted to go to Madrid where it was warmer. He didn't drive, didn't have a car. Could I drive him? And we started off for the drive to Heathrow Airport. And I can't remember the exact conversations, but he said, you do still have those photographs. And then I said, yes, I do. He said, you know what to do with them. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he repeated it, you know what to do with them. Mr. Jewell's um, account is that uh, they were a great bundle of stuff which Francis Bacon told him to throw away and which he didn't. And it's as simple as that. that, that it, was, it was one single act of recuperating uh, material which he had been told to destroy and which he didn't. Well, we know in the case of biography that people are often told to destroy letters and don't, um, and that biographers are duly grateful to them when they don't and duly angry with them when they do as they're told. Um, it's morally an extremely difficult area. Bacon controlled his reputation by allowing us to see only an edited collection of his finished paintings. The posthumous exposure of these new works is sharply dividing opinion in the art world. If these are by Bacon, then they show another world. Suddenly, if they are by Bacon, we have broken into Tutankhamun's throne room. Well, people like to poke about, really, don't they? I mean, <laughs> perhaps he had a sort of collection of his nail clippings or something, or um, a bit of his hair or something like that. 
People like to play fun. If there is um, a heaven or some vantage point at which Francis can now look down on us, he is hooting with laughter at the present state. We have discovered the truth. He did draw and he did prepare the paintings. We know now we've all been duped for 40 years. Bacon always insisted that chance and accident played a crucial part in his work. Because of this, he was seen as a pure, spontaneous artist who could dispense with preparation. It was fascinating to me to think of Bacon as someone who wasn't the perfect artist after all. He wasn't somebody who could just go up to a canvas armed with paints, tools, implements, whatever he painted with, and just throw it all together so that the weight of brush marks was absolutely spot on. He was actually trying things out. He was actually making the movements of his hand that would give him the right weight, the right fluency, when he actually came to do similar kinds of marks on canvas. It doesn't make him any more or less of an artist. In a way, it makes him more interesting. The floor of Bacon's studio is inches deep in photographs, torn from books and magazines of all kinds. In this way, Bacon keeps news shots, stills from films, any kind of visual that has appealed to him that one day he may use. You can't any longer make illustration because it's done so much better by the camera and by the cinema. So you have to... I thought about it very clearly this morning, wrote it down. <laughs> And I put it in my pocket. Now I can't remember what I was going to say. Can I use it? Yes, do. What I, what I thought of saying. And um, I, just, I just said, not illustration of reality, but to create images which are concentration of reality and a shorthand of sensation. Bacon was always open about the influence of photography on his work. But this new material suggests that his interest in photographic images went beyond simply using them as a source. If you'd send Francis, draw two men slamming into each other in a boxing match, he couldn't have done it. Cold. But give him a photograph, and he can immediately take it a stage further can see him thinking in three dimensions. How can I translate this image of violence into something which is almost baroque in the sequence of movements? And that is what those corrections, those oil adjustments to the photographs do. They add a third dimension. When Bacon begins serious work, in around 1944. This is done against the, the moment of the high tide of the news magazine, the photo news magazine. And what they, what they show is a society of, of speed, horror, brutality, glamour, fame. At some point in the 1950s and 60s, Bacon begins to regard photography as a rival because it has undermined painting completely. Bacon was being a kind of demonic picture editor. There are ways in which Bacon begins to treat photographs in news magazines which show him being quite murderous towards that rival. He attacks them, he lacerates them, he scratches them, he tries to paint over them, he tries to seduce them with gorgeous paint marks. If that fails, he rips into them. Sometimes he erases them with chemicals. When I saw them, I was so puzzled because I, there are no other works by Bacon that are public, if, if, uh, that are in the public domain, that remotely resemble these things. The content of these things feel secretive. 
If Bacon never intended for these works to be seen, it is surprising that he did not get rid of them, particularly when he is known to have destroyed several hundred finished canvases. He could, uh, he could just turn against a, a painting, probably a very good one. And when you went into his studio, you'd often see, uh, you know, the small heads with the, the center just uh, razored out because he'd come in the next day and um, thought, well, that's not good enough. Walking into that studio, you, were, you immediately realized you were walking over um, discarded bacons and more than that, cut up, chopped up canvases all over the floor. Um, there was something actually very disturbing about it because some of those canvases, you looked down and you realized that, that, th that the paintings had had the figures scissored out of them or razored out of them so that you were left with a kind of empty silhouette. And this was more than just a fit of dissatisfaction. There was something quite violent going on there, I think. Um, perhaps even ritualistic. For example, what do you do? What do you What do you do? It's not a question of fear. I'm afraid of fear. What do you have to do? I'm afraid of violence. Even if I've suffered the violence, often. I've suffered all my dents with my enemies. I think Francis' masochism is at the core of his work. 30, 40 years ago, all this was new. It was new, uh, new territory. It wasn't written about. It wasn't, um, it was kept very dark and very secret. And I think Francis liked the, this whole thing being kept very dark and very secret. It's always the masochist in these relationships who is actually the aggressor. It's always the masochist who's setting up the scene. The desire of the masochist is very often very strongly to control what happens, and masochists get very angry if the sadists don't stick to the script, for example. It seems to me that Bacon, um, he did wear his, his wounds as kind of badges, as trophies of his experience. And I think he, he seems to have enjoyed that confrontation with other people, not, not the physical sexual confrontation, but with his friends and acquaintances, of letting them know that he lived this kind of dangerous existence. Um, and again, it flew in the face of all that kind of bourgeois kind of crap that he, you know, ultimately was very against. I think the art establishment always knew Francis Bacon to be more than a little wild. I think they wanted a tidy amount of obscenity, a tidy amount of perversity, but if, if I'd included all the dirt that I really got on Francis Bacon and his private life along the way, the film would be unshowable. You know, forget Pasolini's Salo. You know, it's like it's a whole other sort of territory here. The first time I went to Francis' studio, he was working away, but not working away as most painters would, doing sketches for paintings or, or preparing the painting, but rehearsing the effects of his paintings on his own face. He had this extraordinary array of pots of Max Pat to make up, from pancake makeup, from white to sort of dark brown. And he'd let his beard grow about a quarter of an inch, and he was trying out rehearsing those sort of brush strokes of his and the sort of gestural brush tricks. And this, for Francis, was what drawing would be for another painter. I mean, this was rehearsing the effect on himself. You feel this, him, that he somehow uh, turned himself into paint and smeared himself on the canvas. He was a 
nature of, of chameleon transitions. He was, after all, um, a gent to begin with. And even though he may have preferred being buggered by the grooms to, to going to the local dances with suitable girls, um, he knew how to behave. The, one of the consequences of knowing how to behave is that he had that kind of social grace that enabled him to move from one level of society or one activity of society to another with, with consummate ease. But there's this sense of theatre in all the pictures, and I think um, there was... He lived his life in the same kind of way. I think he lived his life as theatre and spent all his social time out. You know, he was out in clubs, in pubs, on the street, in restaurants, uh, wearing makeup, being a personality. He was on display. I think Bacon was very authentic in his self-invention. He was very conscious, I think literally conscious, of his image in terms, you know, the guy used to wear makeup and dye his hair and, um, I mean, I've been told, I don't know if it's true, that he'd had a couple of facelifts. Um, you know, on the most superficial level, he was interested in his image. We live in a, in a time of images and image making. And Bacon, in the post-war years, coincides, you know, almost exactly with the advent of mass media. You know, I mean, he becomes a celebrity in this country in the sort of early 60s with colour supplements. Um, although he feigned this kind of distance from all of those things, he was absolutely party to it all. And, but it would be impossible to be an artist then and now and not play that game. The moment he went out, he would take down one of his freshly pressed suits that he kept um, in cellophane, just to one side of the studio, and uh, an impeccable shirt. I mean, he, uh, he would dress like a very correct and prosperous banker. He hated the idea of looking bohemian, of looking arty. This was something that uh, he felt that uh, probably second-rate artists did. And then probably if he was going out for a a long night in Soho, he might don rather more sinister gear, which would often make, made him look a little bit like a, a Nazi policeman or something. He'd have a big leather, black leather overcoat. Everything very tight, with epaulettes and uh, drawn in, almost as though he was tied up in his clothes. He did mention once how disgusted some people were when they found out that he was wearing female underclothes, knickers and fishnet stockings. He wore very expensive wristwatches, and the point of very expensive wristwatches, I'm told, was that's a great signifier to rough trade that you've got money. Um, it's also a very masculine form of jewellery, obviously. But, um, you know, to a piece of rough trade, they can clock an Oyster Rolex, you know, from 25 paces. Um, it was a, a language of signals. And again, if we go back to pre-67, when homosexuality was illegal, those signs and signals were very important in communicating certain things. For somebody coming from his background, which was an Irish gentry background, and living at the time he did when homosexuality was absolutely forbidden legally, this necessarily meant a clandestine existence. And it meant living it, so to speak, always in the twilight. If the one thing which really drives you forward if your sexual urge is illegal, banned by society, other forms of illegality, other forms of lying. Um, none of those begin to seem so serious. And I think that the result was that he was, I suspect, a person who didn't form 
uh, certain kinds of social bond, certain kinds of bond, bonds of affection, and whose attitude to the world surrounding him was always to some extent adversarial. I don't believe in love, really. I mean, love is marvellous if it, if it happens. And I don't mean sexual love. I mean love of life, love of friends, love of... Well, I, I, I would have said that sexual, uh, love, uh, sexual obsession was the, was the strongest one. After that, what I find said? it very overrated, but I've never experienced it as much as you have, Francis. Oh, really? Well, I think there's only sexual obsession. Francis, my am, I, am I saying no, no, that excitement no, no. is pleasure? If you're excited by something, it yes. gives you pleasure. Yes, you're quite right. Well, there, yes, it is. Right. I do sometimes, Francis, ask stupid, stupid questions in order to get... Well, it's not my fault, is it? I know it is. But I, I do set myself up as... In conversation, Bacon appeared to be remarkably open. But at some level, he always remained elusive. And while he was alive, it was often difficult to challenge his own words about his own art. I wanted something to nail the figure to the bed, and it looked more logical with a hypodermic syringe. I couldn't put a nail through their arm, so it was much easier to put a hypodermic syringe. He always denied that the syringes had anything to do with drugs. His denial that they had meaning is uh, a kind of foot on. Are you going to go along with me? Are you sufficiently intimidated by me to, to swallow the story? Do you dare to contradict me? Uh, if you do dare to contradict me, am I going to throw you out of the restaurant? Well, I am paying the bill. Yes. Am I going to be the only one drinking? For 30 years, the critic David Sylvester attempted to explain this difficult artist to the public. In their many interviews, both David Sylvester's questions and Bacon's answers remained remarkably consistent. Critics divide into groupies and non-groupies. David is, and I don't say this unkindly, an absolute born groupie. He is somebody who loves to be seduced by an artistic personality. It's the most rarefied form of seduction. He loves the idea of being a kind of bride of Christ, as far as Bacon is concerned. Bacon knew that he had an absolutely sympathetic audience, an audience which was most unlikely to uh, report anything which he, Bacon, didn't want reported. And this book of interviews has been the textbook of every ambitious art student that I know, uh, that here is, the, here is the mold, here is the type, not necessarily of the kind of art that student wants to make, but of the kind of person he would like to be, the laid-back, nihilistic, in-your-face, uh, not taking no shit from no one, artist. That's why the cool Britannia guys, this is why the Damien Hirst and all that generation, they still make an icon of Bacon. They make an icon of Bacon not because of the work, but because of the personality. That's what they want to be. They'd love to be that. Gosh, they'd love to have a David Sylvester too. <laughs> well. <laughs> you have one person who has had a stranglehold on the interpretation. And nobody has dared tread on that holy ground until now, when some of us have felt compelled to tread on it, to push a little, you know. What you've been saying all these years is not entirely true. Your interviews are marvelous. You have explained endlessly how Bacon functions, but in certain respects, you are now known to be wrong. David Sylvester is the man one goes to when talking about Francis Bacon's work, or he just sits like a mighty rhinoceros over the, the work of Francis, what he's, what he's done in the past. So it was important to show it to him. Barry Jewell did arrange for Sylvester to view the new work and says he was enthusiastic. In a lecture at the Tate in 1996, Sylvester even spoke about it with great interest. 
Practically no other artist in history has so suppressed circulation of his works on paper. Perhaps he feared that knowledge of their existence might seem to invalidate his doctrine of the importance of improvising on the canvas. Or perhaps he was too modest to recognize the inherent quality of some of these works and saw them only as preparatory studies and therefore as no concern to anyone else. And it wasn't simply a matter of keeping quiet about it. He lied about it to the end. The next step, now these things were coming out, and people were interested, would be to have an exhibition at the Tate. And all this works on paper, we'll call it, was splayed out on various tables. And various critics were invited to come, including the curators from the Tate and David Sylvester. Large number of trestle tables were put out. And I spent some of my time looking at the others who were there and watching them, having absolutely no reaction to it, not knowing what to do with it, not knowing whether to say, isn't this terrific? Was it safe to say it's terrific? Or should I say it's rubbish? Shall I say it's genuine? Shall I, you know, I, like, like mice running around in sort of fear of a tomcat. Fascinating. Not even the director of the Tate had much to say about it. He, of all people, was certainly not going to commit himself one way or the other. I thought, from David Sylvester's initial enthusiasm, that things would go smoothly, would march forth to an exhibition at the Tate. But when David Sylvester came in, the mood had changed. He was, seemed to be skeptical, seemed to be not the same euphoric David Sylvester that had first been struck by this material. Everyone looked at the pieces for two or three hours, and then everybody went home. There was no discussion, nothing. David Sylvester cut me out of his life. I couldn't get in touch with him. I couldn't, couldn't make contact. He just followed me off saying, I will write to you. David Sylvester later issued a statement which seemed to distance him from his initial enthusiasm, saying, I am amongst those who cannot see Bacon's hand on these pages. He declined to take part in this program. Within a matter of weeks of these works being shown to the Tate Gallery and being dismissed, they were purchasing 40 sketches of a very similar stylistic nature, I might add, from the estate for 350,000 quid, 300,000 quid of it from lottery money. Now, when they were looking at those works, which were on free offer, the hugest archive relating to any 20th century British artist's work is on offer to the Tate Gallery. They're prepared to dismiss it on the say-so of, you know, one or two people. Those were perfectly safe, you see. When, you, when the Tate buys something, it's like, the, it's like the curator of interpretation of the Tate said to me once, when I said, why the hell then to buy paintings by young painters while they're still at school. And he said, oh, we prefer to pay 20,000 pounds to somebody in Bond Street. Then we know they're all right. So the Tate's attitude to undiscovered material is that if it comes from an impeccable source, like some wrinkled old poet who knew Bacon for 40 years, then it must be safe. That we'll buy. If it comes from his friends, uh, who owned the house in, in Tangier, which he used to stay. Um, that's all right. We, we, yes, we can cope with that. But, the, but this, this huge quantity of new material, which is supposed to come straight from the studio, and we don't know anything about it. And we, you know, all these, all these important critics have been to the studio and they've never seen anything like it. How can we be certain? No, 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 leave it alone. Let, let, let somebody else prove that it's genuine. We asked the Tate to give their opinion of Barry Jewell's material, but they said it would be inappropriate to comment on works which they do not own. It's been said by one Bacon authority, uh, Mr. Sylvester, I believe, that the material undoubtedly emanated from Bacon's studio, that is, that's a rather curious phase, phrase, since we know that um, 
Bacon didn't have a studio in the old master sense. There are no little pupils or uh, apprentices who would be working away on little things while the master worked away on big ones. Sylvester does not believe in the, in the Jewel Archive. Do I think it's a question of provenance? Yes, I do. Um, and I think the whole question of the provenance is the most difficult. I think anybody such as myself that comes along and upsets a very clean, pat theory of Bacon, that's the finished work, that's all there is, that's what counts, and discounts everything else to the point of firing mud at it so it's effectively kicked to the back of the closet to gather dust. I'm not happy about it, obviously. People have become obsessed by painting. They go to galleries in a way they never used to go because they're obsessed by the money that paintings make. They're absolutely haunted by so that. After all, most people, most people have no feeling about painting at all. They're not interested in art at all. Why should they be? Very few people are. They don't know the good from the bad, but they're influenced by the money. Bacon was one of the first 20th century British artists to achieve an international reputation. He was represented by the powerful Marlborough Gallery, who helped turn the art market into a billion dollar industry. In his lifetime, Bacon's paintings commanded prices of up to four million pounds. How do you get people to know about Bacon from Moscow to Minneapolis? It is by exploiting the personality through the press, through any medium you can get. And of course, if you have some quiet mouse tucked away in the country who is never seen by man or beast painting marvelous pieces, this isn't quite the same as having Francis Bacon getting roaring drunk and being a kind of loud-mouthed homosexual very publicly at a time when that is simply not permitted. I mean, you know, these, these are all aspects of the personality that a dealer, because a dealer is after all a publicist, if nothing else he is a publicist, can, can exploit. The Powerful Gallery is a large business organization. It has PR, it has modern PR. It not merely sends out press releases, but it contacts the right people. Um, uh, its, its, its employees also schmooze with the right clients they make the clients feel that they ought to have a Francis Bacon and that the price is, though high, an acceptable one. That kind of operation is very sophisticated today, but it had already begun 20 years ago. And, and Bacon was a beneficiary. He was prolific, but not too prolific. Um, though the pictures were supposedly difficult to live with, uh, people who did live with them could feel somehow superior to people who couldn't. They could feel more sophisticated. They could feel more in touch with contemporary life. They could even feel, so to speak, tougher. And those glassy, glossy frames, uh, those extremely shiny gold frames, and uh, even the glass, which Bacon insisted on, uh, those somehow made the paintings more acceptable to rich collectors. They were a form, I think, I suspect, of enshrinement. I think in the early work, the feeling is much more raw and real. You've got this wonderful cocktail. It's a cocktail of beauty and horror. You paint something that you fear, but you make it beautiful. That is a sort of thread that runs through Bacon's work. And that has become his trademark, if you like. But having said that, that's only one idea, you know, and he then repeated it. He repeated it and he repeated it and he repeated it to the point where it becomes a cliche. The empty rhetoric. It's as though he's presenting anguish 
in a very decorative, delightful, desirable form. They are desirable merchandise. You know, it's interesting, in fact, if you look at the work, how his colour palette changes. And in the 60s, it actually becomes kind of quite groovy and vibrant, you know, kind of Mary Quantish almost. You know, there's like, like lovely lavenders and oranges and turquoises come into play. He was a great colourist. And um, people also forget that he was a sort of swishy queen interior designer. And I think that language is very present in the most serious of his kind of painting. If you look at the paintings, all the backgrounds are tightly controlled. There's the, uh, the, the frames, the decor, everything is very precise. And then the central image is like a sudden letting go and the chaos comes in. And that must have been some rhythm in Bacon going from total control to at least simulated lack of control. I think one should never forget that Francis was a great gambler. When I first knew him, he was earning his living giving these gambling parties, which would take place in his own studio, and Francis would be the croupier. And he approached his paintings very much in the spirit of a gambler. Was it going to win? He threw everything he had onto the table, as it were, and, uh, and, and a great deal of the time he lost, he destroyed the paintings. But the successful ones gave Francis the same kind of gratification that he got in Monte Carlo when he made a huge killing. Later, when he m could do automatically what he wanted to do, the quality went off. I mean, there was this sort of gambler's excitement to, to, to the images. I mean, was he going to bring it off? And uh, that gave the painting, for me, a sort of extra excitement. Uh, there was this sort of built into it, was this, this sort of sense of failure. He was battling the odds. He was a gambler. Maybe he was gambling. Maybe this archive, Jewel being summoned and told to get rid of the archive, was a, a gambler's throw on the roulette wheel, red or black. Will he destroy it? Will he open it? Will he open Pandora's box? If he opens Pandora's box, what will happen? It opens, I think, profoundly fascinating uh, perspectives on Bacon's temperament if the archive is, is in fact the real thing. So I visited his uh, studio in Paris on a weekly basis, sometimes on a daily basis. And although I saw lots of photographs around with the odd splash of paint that had just dropped uh, from his brush while he was working or uh, that had got mixed up from the, the painting table, I never saw anything like that. I don't really see Bacon, the Bacon I knew, spending his time, as it were, making mark after mark on photograph after photograph. I don't see where it was, uh, it was leading him. It seems to me very contrary to everything one knows about Bacon's working practice. But there can be surprises. They're not signed. They're not dated. They're not inscribed. Though, um, in terms of documentary proof, um, I don't know. But I do know something about painting. And I recognize in those the qualities that I, um, shall we say, uh, expect to find in a Bacon sketch. Time and time and time again, you look at these messed about photographs to put no fine point on it. And immediately an, an alternative image comes into your mind. And there's one here in which it, it's a very confused figure riding a bicycle. In his confusions of it, it seems to have one figure and three bicycles. An extraordinary thing to, to, to want to do. But when you get to the finished picture, something of that multiplicity of bicycles survives. I just don't think they're at all relevant to the, um, the important work. You see, I think if, if Bacon had considered these things to be important, he would have uh, shown them, which obviously he didn't do. Uh, 
I don't know. I think they're his own business in a way. And I, I think they're irrelevant and not really of much importance. I mean, the important thing are the paintings where he is making that magic with a paint. One feels strongly with certain works by Bacon that there's great pain involved in their making. And in some of the sketches which I saw in the, in the uh, Jewel archive, I had a similar sense of pain and authenticity of feeling, which must be very difficult to simulate. And it's the reason why I'm convinced that those works are authentic. the Francis Bacon work, which relates to the Van Gogh series, the Pope series, the wrestlers, and there are sketches which seem to me to relate to all these different series of works from between 45 and, say, 1965. through I thought nobody could possibly fake this why would anybody go to these ends of faking thousands of sheets of faking work over all sorts of different periods through different genres through different techniques for the sake of giving it to the take gallery but I you know I can't help being circumspect and having lingering doubts and thinking that I may possibly be the victim of a Chattertonian hoax you know I mean if this is a hoax it is one of the biggest hoaxes of the century. Dealers are already suggesting that the Jewel archive may be worth two million pounds or more. But Barry Jewel says he does not want or need to sell. He does, however, hope to have the work exhibited. So far, museums and public galleries seem unwilling to commit. I hope, ultimately, I am doing him a justice in allowing this material to be exhibited. I hope I can show where his struggle came from. And I hope this work that he did give me will do justice to his legend. And if I can help in a small way of carrying on this legend, I will be happy. Perhaps up there, Francis, <laughs> sitting on a cloud with a glass of champagne, might be happy too. There has been a history of bacon fakes, of forgeries, and I can see bacon's amusement at the whole idea. I remember we went together into the Marlborough Gallery where uh, the um, the people at the Marlborough were standing round with this uh, fake bacon, with a, a photograph uh, transparency of uh, a fake bacon. And uh, everybody sort of imagined he would explode with anger and sort of say, you know, you must uh, really make sure uh, these things stop. And he took it and looked at it very, very carefully against the light. And there was a long silence and he said, you know, it's not bad. It's not bad at all. I think I'll use that staircase. <laughs> it's vultures in French. Les vautours. J'ai beaucoup de vultures qui descendent sur moi. Birds of prey. What birds of prey? Des oiseaux de proie. Des des oiseaux de proie. J'en ai beaucoup qui qui descendent sur moi. Qui descendent sur vous. Qu'est-ce qu'est-ce qu'ils viennent chercher chez vous? Ils ils commencent à chercher l'argent comme comme les comme tout tout le reste du monde. Well, yeah, I, 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 I,
ce qu'il trouve, mais après de temps en temps, il devient un peu détourné aussi, parce que nous pouvons de temps en temps les offrir une vie qui est plus amusante. A selection of Francis Bacon's controversial drawings are reproduced in an illustrated transcript of the programme. To order, send a cheque or postal order for £3.50, payable to Channel 4, to Art House, the other Francis Bacon, P.O. Box 4000, Manchester M60, 3LL.